Thank you for joining us. We are on location at the Hilton Orlando for the JNF National Conference. The Jewish National Fund was founded in the year 1901 to develop the land in Israel. Since its inception, the JNF has planted over 240 million trees and has turned barren land into fertile green fields. It's also built 180 dams and reservoirs and established more than 1,000 parks throughout the land of Israel. Israel Ambassador Ido Aroni will tell us more about the essential role the JNF has played in the history of the State of Israel following these messages. With us now is Israel Ambassador Ido Aroni. Mr. Aroni, it's a pleasure to have you back on the show. How are you, sir? Thank you for having me. You're here visiting Orlando for the JNF. What are the challenges facing JNF at this time? Well, I think like um, you know, any organization, um, uh, primarily um, there are challenges to um, raise more money and have all the resources that they need to have in order to, uh, in order to carry out their wonderful plans. That's a major challenge. I think another challenge uh, facing uh, national Jewish organizations of the caliber of the JNF is uh, to attract younger audiences to make sure that they maintain their high level of relevance uh, with the younger members of the community as well. Uh, third challenge, would, uh, I would say, is to bring into the fold uh, people that care passionately about Israel that are not necessarily Jewish. It's true that the organization is called the Jewish National Fund, but actually its agenda its mission statement, its charter is to a large degree universal. Every person that cares about the environment can identify with the great work of JNF. So I think that's another um, goal. So we have three things. One is to get all the resources that you need. The second is to um, gain access to the younger generation. And the third is to expand the scope of your influence beyond the Jewish community. Serving as an ambassador, obviously, you're more involved in politics on a daily basis than uh, the concern for one very worthwhile organization. How do you see the ever-changing situation in the Middle East? Well, serving as Israel's Consul General to the Tri-State area is um, always uh, interesting because uh, you run into so many people, so many people that have different views of what's happening in the Middle East. Um, the one thing that I see consistently since I started uh, my position, as you know, this is the third time I'm serving in the United States, this is my third overseas posting, is that uh, somehow uh, it seems like people are always um, interested in the so-called situation. And every time it's a different situation. So now the situation has several components. The first is the situation with Iran. Iran's aspirations to become a nuclear military power, which is something that we believe the world should not tolerate, and not only because we stand to lose from it, we're right there geographically at the forefront, uh, but we believe that Iran poses a threat to the entire international community. The second component of the situation is obviously the regional uh, unrest, the wave of uh, demonstrations that in some places um, turned into a full-blown um, revolutions and civil unrest, um, it's of great concern to us because, um, unfortunately, it doesn't look like uh, democracy is going to prevail in all those countries, although some encouraging dimensions of it were introduced in some places. Uh, but it looks more like the rise of political Islam than anything. And therefore, we believe that um, it's a problem if uh, Sinai Peninsula becomes a hotbed for terrorist organizations, it's going to be a problem. Uh, if uh, regimes um, um, will rise in the Middle East that do not accept Israel and that support terrorist groups, it's going to be a problem. So that's the second component of the situation. The third component of the situation 
is obviously lack of progress with the Palestinians, uh, which unfortunately are uh, declining uh, all the attempts made by Israel and the United States to bring them back to the table of negotiations. Uh, we know that they are trying once again, as they did last year, to um, impose uh, themselves on the international community through the uh, unilateral uh, declaration of independence maneuver, maneuver at the UN. Uh, we believe that's wrong. We believe that um, the, the way to achieve progress between Israelis and Palestinians is through direct negotiations and direct negotiations only. The road to Palestinian independence that we're committed to, Prime Minister Netanyahu spoke about it at the Bar Ilan speech. Um, president Bush was the first US president to officially commit to it and other uh, uh, administration officials as well. Uh, the road to that goes through Jerusalem. And what the Palestinians are trying to do is to get the international community to put external pressure on Israel in order to avoid the need to direct, directly negotiate with Israel. We think it's wrong. So here you have three components for the situation that are of concern to us. The aspirations for peace. Many people argue the following point. They say up until 1967, the Arabs had East Jerusalem, the Golan Heights, Sinai, the West Bank, and they were not willing to recognize Israel's right to exist. Why would they accept today what they refused to accept up until 1967? Because time is not working um, in their favor. Time is of the essence. We believe that um, that is the case. And were they are better, whether better off today than they were four years ago or 10 years ago or 15 years ago, that's really the only uh, measurement. And again, when you're looking at it, um, the, um, the job of every leadership, including the Palestinian leadership, is to cater to their own constituencies, to take care of their own people, to do good by them. But here's the thing. Over the years, and I think um, more um, forcefully in the last 12 years since the collapse of the Kem David Accords in the summer of the year 2000, through the Palestinian violent response to Ariel Sharon's disengagement plan in 2005, all the way to the um, decline of the Olmert proposal by Abu Mazen in 2008, the string of those occurrences convinced many Israelis that maybe the issue at hand is not necessarily land. Maybe there's something else. Because after all, here you have three examples of major dramatic events that were about land, right? In Camp David, Clinton put forth a far-reaching compromise that would give the Palestinians the majority, the overwhelming majority, of all of their territorial claims. In 2005, Ariel Sharon actually fulfilled the Palestinian territorial dream. He pulled out of Gaza, gave them the key to Gaza. What did they do with it? They turned Gaza into a launching pad to launch more and more attacks against innocent Israelis. And then in 2008, according to Condoleezza Rice, Ehud Olmert gave Abu Mazen everything they wanted from a territorial point of view, and they said no. Maybe there's something else. Maybe the real issue is not land. Maybe the real issue is their ongoing refusal to accept our right to exist. And if this is the case, as many Israelis fear, then it requires a whole different treatment. Then now you can understand where the demand on our part for the Palestinians to accept Israel's right to exist, not only in peace and security, but also as the national homeland of the Jewish people, that's where it's coming from. Because unless that would change, then it's going to be very difficult to achieve progress. Um, we can solve technical problems, but it's far more difficult when you need to change the mindset of peoples throughout the region. And that's really the task at hand. It begins with education. That's why we emphasize so much the issue of incitement to violence and the delegitimization of Israel in their textbooks, even textbooks that are being used by elementary school students and the territories throughout the Arab world. There is a horrific 
demonization process of Israel in the Arab world. And America. And the United States, of course. So these are the issues that we need to tackle if we want to be able to begin that process of changing the mindset of the peoples in the region. Speaking of education, there are some beautiful examples like the Arava Institute where you have Palestinian students and people from all over the world sitting with Israelis and discussing uh, joint uh, issues and concerns for the environment and so forth, which is very inspiring. It's wonderful. But on the other hand, you have midrasas in from Pakistan to the, the other end of the Arab world all inciting youth uh, to believe in horrific things. So what realistically can one do to change the educational situation here? Well, I think it would be a very difficult task, uh, and we're certainly not the perfect candidate to change the mindsets of Muslims and Arabs throughout the world when it comes to the state of Israel. Um, it's, 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 it's a monumental task, and I don't think that Israel is, is equipped to be the country or the person to, uh, Israeli diplomat is not the perfect person to address uh, those nations and those societies. However, uh, you mentioned uh, the wonderful story of the Arava Institute, which really is a huge success. And I have to tell you, it, it really proves the point that uh, we've been trying to make all along. When people are passionate about something, let's say about the environment, let's say people are passionate about water, people are passionate about gay rights, people are passionate about extreme sports, people are passionate about lifestyle, wine, and architecture, and art, when they're passionate about something, it's easier to engage in a meaningful conversation with them when this is the subject matter. So when you bring people to Israel, you mentioned Arava, to bring about the environment, to, to talk about the environment, to talk about renewable energy, to talk about things that are critical to who they are, to their personality, to their identity. Same thing with gay rights. When you bring gay people to Israel and you show them now, we've been accused of pinkwashing. There's nothing to wash. Israel is, indeed, the most gay-friendly country in our region. That's a fact. Yeah, so we have problems. It's not perfect, but no place is perfect. No human being is perfect. So we tell the world, don't judge Israel by its imperfections. Judge Israel by the attempt we're making to fix them. Don't judge Israel by our weaknesses. This is the only message that we think can be conveyed to those, to those people to the extent they're willing to listen. Are there similar institutes in Arab countries? Certainly they have endless wealth. Are there any inspiring examples such as Arab Institute in the multitude of Arab countries? Look, I'm not familiar with the turf uh, when it comes to uh, efforts to combat desertification in the Arab world. Uh, no question that the question of desert, the problem of desert, is of main concern to them. I'm not familiar with what is being done over there, but I can tell you uh, that the fact that um, uh, students from Arab countries participate, and we also have another example in the field of basketball. There's a, a wonderful friendship uh, tournament every year in June that brings together basketball teams of youths from throughout the region from Jordan and even from Turkey, from all, all the countries. And it's a great celebration of tolerance. It's a great celebration of uh, peaceful coexistence through sports. And again, you set politics aside, and then you can have a real conversation. And that's really the, our hope, is that we will be able to increase the number of those niche conversations that we're having with various groups and not ignoring, without ignoring, the uh, difficult geopolitical situation, but developing relevance, as we say, with those groups becomes critically important. You are optimistic that through education, sport, and mutual cooperation, it is possible to see a happier future in the Middle East despite uh, some trepidation regarding the somewhat disappointing Arab Spring. It's not just about education and sport. It's way more than that. It's about everything that you know, Israel represents. Um, the great shift here is to look at Israel as a country uh, through the prism of its advantages. Whereas in the past, we focused on Israel's problems, right? So the task at hand was to win a debate and an argument about who's right and who's wrong. Now we're saying it's time 
while we need to continue the debate about who's right and who's wrong, because we genuinely believe that we are right, but it's not enough. If you want to be attractive, if you want to bring people to Israel, to invest money, to give money to JNF, to, uh, to do whatever it is you want them to do, you have to be relevant to them. And the way you do that is by broadening the conversation. So broadening the conversation about Israel today becomes essential if you want to increase um, Israel's performance, to improve Israel's performance, if you'd like to increase the number of people attracted to Israel, the number of people curious about Israel, the number of people wanting to know more about Israel, that's what you have to do. You have to broaden the conversation. The JNF is a big part of, their, of that broader conversation, and we are broadening that conversation every day. Let me give you a couple of examples. The number of tourists that came to Israel in 2011 is the highest number in Israel's history, almost 4 million. We believe that 2012 will even break that record. Uh, Israel is making tremendous progress in the world of culture and the arts. You have uh, an emerging Israeli film industry, you have more and more Israeli documentaries that are being sold to American television outlets, you have many Israeli television series that were adopted and remade here in the United States. So the presence of Israel in a positive, constructive context is on the rise in a very, very dramatic way. And I think that is helping us to improve our overall positioning, and we're already seeing the results. You're regarded as one of the most uh, inspiring of Israeli leaders, members of the diplomatic corps and so forth, and it brings to mind the concern that there is excessive bickering in Israel, as in many democracies. What are your thoughts with regard to all of the arguing going on in the Knesset and so forth? Well, you know, some of it is, is not... Um, um, pleasant to watch sometimes the heated debates and things that are said, but on the other hand, uh, every democracy is paying a price for its openness and for its uh, pluralism and for its tolerance of uh, diversity, but it's a price worth paying. Um, I think that Israel's democracy is uh, vibrant, it's dynamic, can be a little bit noisy, can be a little bit straightforward, too straightforward, but uh, at the end of the day, it's our greatest asset. The fact that uh, the world knows that we are a democracy, there's a rule of law in Israel, a solid legal system, great academic system, people are given permission to ask questions, uh, sometimes also to challenge authority. There's an open, open public debate on every issue. The free press, freedom of press is part and parcel of our DNA as a society, uh, great uh, uh, civil liberties to all ethnic groups, including Arab Israelis that enjoy more freedom in Israel than their peers in the Arab world. Uh, even the Palestinians, by the way, talking about education. How many universities did they have before 67 in the West Bank? And how many universities they have today? Uh, I believe that today you're looking at six academic institutions, um, where before 67 they have none. Um, looking at the level of their education today, they're much better off than their peers throughout the Arab world. So we need to look at that too, not only at the, uh, at the negatives, but also lots of positives. And, and I'm grateful that you invited me to, uh, to say a few words here today. It's our honor, and I want to thank you very, very much for being with thank us you, today. Thank, thank you, you so sir. Much. I'll be right back.